right. Hi, everyone. I'm Steph. And I'm Lisa. And together we're, we're PD, PD Connect. Connect. Thanks for joining us today. We have Dr. Indu here, and I'm going to read the intro and introduce her and let her just get going. Yeah. All right. All right. So Dr. Indu Subramanian received her medical degree from the University of Toronto, Canada. She did her neurology residency and movement disorder fellowship training at UCLA. Dr. Subramanian has stayed on at the UCLA and is now a clinical professor of neurology and has assumed the position of the director of the Southwest Parkinson's Disease Research Education and Clinical Care Center of Excellence in Parkinson's Disease. That is a big role. <laughs> That's a very big role. All right. She has developed a strong interest in integrated medicine with a special interest in yoga and mindfulness, which I'm very excited to hear about. Mm -hmm. She underwent a 200-hour yoga teacher training and studied mindfulness at the VA through Insight LA. She is designing a yoga teacher training program for yoga instructors who are interested in working with PD patients. Dr. Subramanian got, bo got board certified in integrative medicine. She is also passionate about palliative care and Parkinson's disease. She did a, a contemplative fellowship for healthcare providers through the New York Zen Center is an, and is an AAN Palatucci fellow. Dr. Subramanian's main research interest is on the effects of loneliness in people living with Parkinson's. She's the host of a virtual support group and world with world experts in PD and co-hosts and edits a blog for people with PD. Very amazing. Very cool. Thank you so much welcome. for being here. Yes, welcome. Let me get rid of this and find. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It's just so nice to see everyone out there. Um, I, I guess I can share a screen um, and teach you a little bit about what we've been working on and maybe then open it up for some questions and stuff like that. So um, definitely want to uh, make sure that we cover things that people are interested in. But my main interest these days is on the concept of wellness in Parkinson's. So we'll teach you a little bit about that and then um, we'll go from there. We'll see where all of this takes us. So I want to make sure that you guys can see what I'm trying to present. And um, I guess people are joining us. Uh, so can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, so we just uh, have been spending some time, you know, as clinicians trying to figure out what we have been doing right and also what we've not been doing so well. So, um, so I think many of you know that the reason we call Parkinson's disease Parkinson's uh, disease is because it was named after James Parkinson, who described Parkinson's disease back about 200 plus years ago in this essay um, in which he talked about tremulous motion and muscular power. Um, and action, parts not in action and even when supported with the propensity to bend the trunk forwards and to pass from a walking pace. Um, and then he goes on to say that the senses and intellects being uninjured. So he was right about some part of this definition, but really it was, um, you know, many things about Parkinson's he didn't really describe very well. And I think we've been sort of trying to refine sort of how to teach around this and how to do better in terms of how we're sort of um, addressing these issues. But, you know, a lot of the times when we're teaching medical students about this disease, we're really talking about this type of slide. So put up these images of people, and I think you can recognize that many of these people look quite similar to each other. So they're all kind of Caucasian, largely men who are older. And this is the image of Parkinson's disease that we've been propagating and teaching around. And then we use this mnemonic here, um, and uh, we teach around tremor and stiffness and slowness and gait issues, which is really these motor symptoms. And so I think a lot of the times when patients walk in um, looking diverse and different, um, the di diagnosis is actually missed. And we really have been focusing largely on motor symptoms. But really often when we talk to patients about Parkinson's and what really affects them, it's really not these sort of motor issues, but really other things in terms of non-motor issues that affect them. So, so I think, you know, we've sort of come to understand that there's this huge non-motor burden of things that are lying under this iceberg. And really when patients present to us and we teach around this, we're really just focusing largely on the motor symptoms and really this huge non-motor burden, huge mental health burden is really often not addressed. And so in the last um, couple of years, I've been focusing my attention and research um, on trying to figure out how to do better and to try to serve populations a little bit better and to help destigmatize a lot of the issues that really affect our patients. Parkinson. So, um, so I'll teach you a little bit about that today. So we've been, um, uh, we just had this paper um, that we came up with about uh, a year and a half ago, looking at mental health issues and the access to mental health um, help 
with Parkinson's. And we see that there's all kinds of reasons why patients with Parkinson's are not getting good care. And one of them is actually stigma. So a lot of people think that Parkinson's is largely a motor disease and not um, really people aren't aware that uh, there's a huge non-motor burden along with this mental health burden. And so de things like depression and anxiety, apathy, these things are all part and parcel of the disease. Cognitive issues can be seen in Parkinson's. There's a lot of different things in the, the sort of um, mental health world that can really affect our patients. And I think with COVID-19 and the sort of issues with being socially isolated and all the loss that we've had in grief as a society that we're we're undergoing really I think a lot of these mental health issues are not just seen in diseases like Parkinson's but just across the world so um, we have a huge sort of um, need for more resources in this space and really a real scarcity of um, how we can access this so the folks like um, these late lovely ladies who run the support group are, are part of the solution and what you're doing right now with connecting to each other and learning about this um, sort of problem is, is part of the solution. So I'll teach you a little bit about that. But we really have, you know, a number of folks that have been stuck in their homes isolated. Um, there's a huge caregiver burnout issue, which is part of um, this problem as well. A lot of our caregivers um, have been home sometimes taking care of their loved ones um, nonstop for two years without a lot of respite. And so, you know, we have to sort of think about how all of this is affecting our population of Parkinson's patients. And also, there's a huge amount of folks, um, and I just showed you that slide about the images of Parkinson's with this, you know, sort of sense of Caucasian older men, but there's a, no, a large number of patients that are not being served with the sort of education and, and the way that we study and treat these uh, sort of this disease. This is a disease that affects people worldwide of many, many different age groups. Um, there are more men than women, but certainly there are a number of uh, folks that are have historically not been getting great care. And we also have been largely focusing on motor issues. So I want to sort of posit a little bit of a different approach to you. So historically, we've been able to get a sense of some um, sense of who may be at risk for getting Parkinson's with things like um, predicting Parkinson's disease from things like uh, lack of sense of smell. Sometimes patients can describe sleep disorders for sometimes 10 to 15, 20 years before uh, they ever walk in our uh, door complaining of motor symptoms. And so we've actually been able to get a sense of possibly predicting who might get Parkinson's even before they develop motor symptoms. Then as we follow people through the stages of disease, we see that there are a number of motor issues that affect people, but really this non-motor burden that I mentioned to you, things like anxiety, depression, cognitive issues, sleep dysfunction, all of these things are things that we haven't really been able to address terribly well. And so I think that you know we have a long way to go and historically, what we've really done well, I think, is take this um, oldie but goodie pill, levodopa carbidopa, this um, otherwise known as Cinemet, and repackage it in different ways and help motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We've also been able to refine surgeries to help the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but really this non-motor burden and the mental health burden are things that we haven't been um, really addressing very well. And so um, I've been spending some time trying to help um, in the Movement Disorder Society, which is our main society, um, looking at sort of a new way of thinking about how to proactively educate and empower patients with Parkinson's. And I'd like to take you a little bit um, on this journey with me. And we've just proposed and got this new task force accepted called the Wellness Task Force. And so I've been giving this type of lecture for a few years, but I think our society that is our international way of taking care of patients with Parkinson's um, and educating around this uh, as, as clinicians who care about this, um, this disease state, um, this is finally having some inroads and we're finally gonna start the dialogue of how to do this better with um, taking care of patients in this wellness sort of approach. So what is wellness? I think wellness has been sort of uh, misunderstood. People think that wellness is like an expensive spa membership or massage therapists or you know you know cute yoga clothes. But really, wellness is this sort of um, in, in the definition that I like to use is this active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that leads to a more holistic state of health. And so the sense is that the person with Parkinson's is in control of certain choices that they make in terms of their lifestyle every day. And that the type of health that we're talking about is not just the standard physical motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but really thinking about health in this more holistic way of thinking about not just um, you know, physical symptoms, but really mental, spiritual well-being, you as the person living with the disease and the people that love you in your environment, as well as sort of thinking about the lifestyle choices that 
that one can make to really change hopefully the progression of the disease and make them feel more in control. So the classic medical paradigm, which is where I studied. So I went to medical school in Toronto about uh, 25 years ago, I guess. And the classic paradigm is that I am the doctor. I wear a white coat. You come to see me as my patient. I see you every three months or six months for about 15 minutes, 30 minutes. You complain of symptoms and I give you medicines to help those symptoms. And then you go home and then you see me again in three to six months. And really the sense is it's very compartmentalized. I'm as a clinician is responsible for how you do. And it's very episodic and corrective. So really a symptoms that I can bill for and the insurance companies pay for this. And this is sort of the way that our modern medical paradigm in the Western world has sort of created the concept of health. But what I like to think about health is more this holistic thing that we're talking about. So not just physical symptoms, but really the sort of sense that you as a person living in your environment can really thrive and what matters to you in terms of your day-to-day -day life what types of activities that you enjoy doing. We talk to you about these things and try to help you sort of incorporate these things into your daily life function. And that you, as the person living with this, are responsible to some degree for the choices that you make in your lifestyle. Kind of like when we talk about preventing heart attacks, that we come up with ways that I, as a clinician, can help you to understand that certain things like exercise as medicine are important and the social connection is part of you know the, the prescription of living better with Parkinson's. So this is sort of this novel concept of being a little bit more proactive, more preventative and not just treating symptoms. And this fits actually relatively well with certain things that I've been doing um, in, in terms of my um, you know, journey in medicine. So I, um, as the ladies talked about, um, I run a Center for Excellence in Parkinson's in Los Angeles. Um, I take care of this sixth of the US's um, uh, veterans with uh, Parkinson's in one of six centers of excellence in the country. And the VA has been a little, quite open-minded to some of these concepts of this holistic health approach. And so they have this VA whole health model where the patient is in the middle. There's these lifestyle choices that surround the patient in terms of things like exercise, sleep, a nutrition, social connection, mind-body approaches. And we are able to give sort of patients a sense of what may impact them. And then really, um, you know, we were able to help uh, not just with um, treating people with symptoms um, in a conventional approach, but really the sort of more holistic uh, sort of approach to, to sort of care. And so when we think about these wellness components for Parkinson's disease, we can kind of customize them a little bit. And we made this figure, um, we published it in a, in a book actually about sexual health and Parkinson's, um, but um, really thinking about not just um, sort of the motor symptoms, but like, what are all the components that people can have uh, that can really help them live better with their Parkinson's? And in order to live well with Parkinson's, it's important to realize that your general health also has to be good. So things like um, making sure that your vision is good, making sure that your dental health is good, making sure that you can hear well, um, things like bone and gut health are so important for Parkinson's patients as well. And then these other lifestyle choices, so things that I mentioned, diet, sleep, physical exercise, the cultural context that the person that we're seeing is living within, how accessible are these sort of lifestyle choices, what matters to them, all of these things are part of this sort of prescription. And so, um, so it's important, as I mentioned, to think about the cultural context. So all of us have different viewpoints depending on who we are, what we've been raised around. And really, um, I like to, I love this slide of um, the First Nations and their sort of context of uh, wellness. So for them, talking about health, um, it, it has to include things like the land in which they live, the earth on which they live, the other nations in which they um, are living around, um, their ancestors. All of this is very important in terms of their concepts of health. And so I think for each of us to think about this in a culturally competent way, I think we're realizing that we haven't really done this historically and that we've really just served a very niche population, but that to truly take care of everyone on the planet with Parkinson's, we really really need to understand these types of issues. So women specific issues, things around religious beliefs, around um, socioeconomic status, not everyone can afford um, things even around, you know, 
telehealth. So we, we've sort of incorporated video visits in many of our ways. And this support group is actually a video support group, but there's a percentage of people that we're really missing that may not be able to afford the technology or be able to access it due to, um, you know, being living in a rural um, area where they don't have bandwidth. So really we're, we're trying to understand who we're not serving and think a little bit more proactively about how to reach those people seen in 2022 um, and the last couple of years that there's a lot of mistrust and a lot of things that we're missing in terms of um, racial um, and ethnic sort of diversity um, in the world. And so this is also part of that sort of cultural context of trying to help people to understand um, how to use these lifestyle choices and incorporate them that in a way that serves them the best. So in part of these dialogues, we started to explore, you know, these unmet needs of people. And as uh, the ladies had mentioned, I've uh, been running a virtual support group for the last um, two years. Um, and uh, we've also been blogging. And we ended up writing this paper on the unmet needs of women um, as an example of a group of folks that has not been well served with Parkinson's. Um, women um, uh, have had a huge un a number of gaps that have been unmet. And what we found, um, just you know, a couple of things uh, just to point out, and you can um, have a look at some of these figures. Um, I can send them, I'll, I'll send this uh, uh, to, to the other folks um, to, uh, as part of the slide deck um, that you can have. Um, but we really noticed that there were a number of things from a hormonal perspective that had never really been talked about. Things like, you know, women who are menstruating with Parkinson's feel worse with their Parkinson's motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms a, the week before they get their period. There's a number of women specific issues around caregiving. So women often feel that because they're caregivers that it's hard for them to take the time out of their own lives to go get care. And so really we have to make care more accessible to them. And also many women have not been well uh, represented in clinical trials. So we really have to make um, accessibility for women. And we're trying to do this more through um, internet-based surveys and things like that to really help um, everyone to be represented in some of the research that we're doing. <clears throat> so um, it was mentioned that I've had an interest in integrative medicine. So people always ask me, look, what is integrative medicine? Well, it's really this borderland um, subject area between West, conventional Western medical approaches and sort of other um, healthcare philosophies that are available in the world. So things like um, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, it incorporates things like the mind-body approaches, um, lifestyle choices, all of these sorts of things would fall under sort of the realm of integrative medicine. And I think it aligns actually quite well with um, the WHO, so the World Health Organization, defined health in the 1940s as um, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And I think, unfortunately, we've really strayed away in the last um, you know, 80 years from that diagnosis um, of the body that represents us as physicians um, and have, have unfortunately really gotten held sort of more hung up on this sort of um, light reactive uh, sort of to symptom uh, approach because of some of what you know we've created with um, the commercialization of the healthcare system and the sort of need to bill insurance for specific complaints. So I think we can really work together to sort of think more about how we can serve people better um, with Parkinson's. And um, so we've been trying to put together sort of this wellness prescription. And one of the things I think that is important to understand when I am talking to people about their health is, you know, what really brings them meaning and joy at this point of life. And, and it may be that, you know, it's, it's very, very different for different people. So for some of my women um, who are grandmothers, it's about being able to play with their grandchildren. Um, for um, some of my men, it might be, you know, playing golf with their best friend. It, so I think, you know, I'm putting up these slides, I, I urge you to think about what the answers to some of these things may be in your own life. Um, sleep is hugely important. Um, so eight hours of sleep per night, if you can get it, is really um, very therapeutic. It's really when we detoxify, it's good for cognition to get good sleep. So um, sleep is huge. The mind-body approaches are uh, very, very important. And as uh, was mentioned, I've uh, done some yoga teacher trainings and some mindfulness trainings. And I really feel like this is a very important area um, for Parkinson's patients. 
when I give these talks, people always say, well, I either, I'm not going to meditate. I can't see myself doing yoga doc. What can I actually do practically to try to incorporate some of this? And I think if we really expand the definition of mind body approaches, I think you might be able to find something that may be more accessible. So just getting out in nature and being still maybe in your garden or on a hike or around trees can actually be part of this. Um, another thing that you might already be doing is prayer. So many people, um, certain cultural uh, context, uh, for example, African-American patients find prayer very accessible. So if you enjoy that, then incorporate more of that. Um, even getting into a flow state with singing, dancing, playing music, art, all of these things actually are very, very therapeutic. Um, and, you know, we've had some studies starting to look at this. So Tai Chi has been studied and seen to be um, have improvements for Parkinson's patients. There's been some yoga studies um, that have been done showing improvements, even anxiety and depression. And I think that yoga is actually quite an exciting area. Um, and I'll just, uh, you know, sort of spend a moment talking about it. The reason that I think yoga is exciting is it incorporates actually some amount of um, cardio, um, some amount of stretching, some amount of balance training, but it also actually incorporates some breathing, which I think is um, very therapeutic from an autonomic nervous system perspective and Parkinson's patients can get issues with the autonomic nervous system. And it also includes some meditation aspects. Um, so uh, there's many, many types of yoga. And so I, I would urge you to sort of check into this if you've never tried it. Um, they had mentioned that I've been doing this contemplative fellowship. And so I've really been doing a deeper dive into things like meditation. I spent the last year with a cohort of about 30 other healthcare providers um, in, in the world, uh, looking at things like meditation and how it may benefit um, not just myself um, as a healthcare provider and help my fellow healthcare providers with this sort of practice, but also, you know, gave me some ideas for how this may benefit Parkinson's patients as well. As well. Uh, one slide that I seem to have um, left out is the fact that exercise is medicine. And so um, I truly believe that exercise is a huge um, sort of uh, exciting um, sort of therapy for Parkinson's disease. Um, and you'll see in a slide or two um, how therapeutic it can be, but really urge people to get out and try to um, get their heart rate up, um, try to exercise. And if you can get the benefits of a group um, exercise uh, perspective, it, it's also actually very therapeutic. So I'm going to um, pivot a little bit and describe a little bit about some of our research. Um, and you had heard in my bio that my one of my main focuses these days is around um, the uh, effects of loneliness in Parkinson's disease. And we published this paper, and this was data that was just um, coming out as the pandemic was hitting. Um, and uh, it basically was um, sort of around the background that I learned um, in going to integrative medicine meetings that social isolation was very um, uh, it was it was very deleterious, so a bad thing for people's health, and that in fact social connection was as basic a human need as food, water, and shelter. And so the census was that um, you know we really had not been paying much attention to this in the Parkinson's world, but we had data looking at social isolation as a risk factor for things like more more mortality and worsened healthcare outcomes. And in fact, we have data. Um, just in general populations that being socially isolated is as bad for you as smoking a half a pack of cigarettes a day or being obese. And so really we wanted to look at this um, in uh, Parkinson's uh, data set and uh, just to define things a little bit. Um, so how does loneliness affect the body? Well, loneliness can affect stress hormones. It can affect immune system. It, it actually is a bad prognostic indicator for developing dementia and also can affect sleep. Um, it can disrupt circadian rhythms and it can actually make people fixate on more socially threatening stimuli. So you can imagine if a, a person living with Parkinson's was isolated in the pandemic with bad news coming in, um, you know, through news channels about, you know, the pandemic and other, other sorts of uh, issues in society today, then one could really tend to fixate and get very wrapped up and um, almost perseverate on things that are very negative um, that are presented through news stories and stuff. And because it can also affect circadian rhythm, many of our patients also had a large disruption in their sleep, which I told you in and of itself is an important thing to help our patients with Parkinson's to get good sleep. 
So we did this study and we were looking at how bad it was um, to be lonely compared to a number of other uh, sort of beneficial uh, things in our population. We were really looking for what modifiable variables could affect people um, living with Parkinson's. And so I told you that exercise is medicine and we saw this in our data set. So it was actually very beneficial in terms of disease severity um, to be exercising 30 minutes a day, seven days a week. And on the flip side to that, it was as bad for you to be lonely as the beneficial effects of exercising seven days a week for 30 minutes a day. So it's a pretty negative uh, prognostic indicator. And if you can imagine people who are having a double whammy of being both lonely and not exercising, this is quite you know, a negative detrimental thing for their Parkinson's symptoms. But on the flip side, we can actually do something about this. And so, you know, if you think about a double bonus of somebody who's exercising and is socially connected, and if you can pick things that get you uh, the benefits of both, I think it can be very, very therapeutic. So in our paper, we really posited this sort of negative downward cycle of being socially isolated, affecting a number of things in the body, disrupting sleep, disrupting stress hormones, causing worsened motor and non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's, affecting mental health issues in Parkinson's with anxiety and depression being worse, and that leading to more social disconnection in this possible negative downward spiral. And we proposed this sort of concept of social prescribing as a positive thing we could do. And so we ended up teaching people about, um, given this research was really the importance of social connection the sense that you know we as healthcare providers could be helping people with uh, the concept of social prescribing and that this could affect both motor and non-motor issues and that there was some need to be proactive about asking people about loneliness and to be proactive about connecting people. One thing that I forgot to tell you is that um, there's really these three spheres of social connection that are important when we talk about um, health. So one sphere is the, the intimate sphere in which you have a connection with somebody in your home. It could be your partner, or your loved one, your wife, your spouse. Then there's this sort of um, friend circle sphere where you have connections outside your home, where you're able to confide in people outside your home. And this is sort of this relational sphere of loneliness. And then there's a third sphere in which we have the ability to connect on a societal level with people in our, in our communities. And so this is um, something like belonging to a support group like this can actually satisfy those, uh, that societal sphere of connection. And so it's actually entirely possible to be lonely, even if you're happily married and you have a loved one that you connect with very well in your home because you're missing this friend circle and you're missing the societal sort of connection through things like a support group or something that brings you meaning that may be a connection even to a church group or um, a different sort of group in your community. So I think we're really trying to be a little bit more proactive in teaching patients about how they can connect better. So I've been running this virtual support group. Um, a number of these things have been recorded and we were doing them one, about once a week. We've cut down now to about once a month, but there's a lot of you know virtual um, activity out there, urge you to sort of check out these things. And I've also been blogging on this um, parkinsonsecrets.com website with one of my colleagues, Dr. Oaken, just trying to really connect the community and give people information. I also did this TED talk on the effects of loneliness that you can check out. Um, it's on a TEDx uh, River Oaks um, YouTube. So we're urging people to really try to socially connect so I think, you know, from diagnosis, this is something that we haven't done a good job of educating around. And so if there's a way that you can get out of your home and find some friends, proactively reach out to people that you may not have reached out to in a while, um, it, it can actually be very therapeutic. Um, and also, you know, I haven't just been talking this talk, I've actually been walking this walk. This is my family. We've been connecting through Zoom every week. Um, my sisters both live um, in other parts of the country and then my parents are sheltering in place still in Canada, um, off and on with this pandemic. Um, and we've been able to connect uh, through these virtual mod modalities. So even just um, you know, a Zoom phone call or a, a regular phone call can actually be very, very therapeutic. And so we've been recommending to patients um, and clinicians to encourage their patients 
to get out of the home. If you can get dressed and get out of the home most days per week, it's actually good for you. Try to connect with friends and family, even through these virtual modalities. Try an exercise class or an online support group class. And even, you know, a phone modality if an old school phone call can actually account for some of this um, sort of uh, social connection brownie points. So I showed you the things that really are mental health barriers um, early in my talk. And so um, we didn't just propose these negative things. We've tried to propose solutions too. And so part of this dialogue is really around getting educated and this sort of support groups are very helpful in this, getting empowered to understand what the lifestyle choices are that can make a difference for you with Parkinson's, help you find ways in your community so to socially connect um, through social prescribing, and then to help you figure out that, you know, you are part of the dialogue and you are part of having control of your own disease outcomes. And so we've really been talking a little bit about self-agency, the con concept that you believe that you individually generate um, your own actions and then the resultant outcomes. When patients feel like they are part of the dialogue, that they're part of um, being able to make a difference in terms of the lifestyle choices that they make, then they actually do a lot better in terms of how um, they do. And this has been shown in outcomes throughout, uh, not just in Parkinson's disease, but other disease states as well. So really the hope is for us to help as um, providers to make you feel in control of your own health, help connect you to possible social support and help you create structure in your daily lives to sort of find activities that you can use um, to help you feel more in control um, of, of sort of these wellness sort of aspect of your life. So um, thank you for the time. And I think there's a lot of ways you can get involved even um, through advocacy work too. I urge you to read this book called Ending Parkinson's Disease. And there's a number of great, um, even uh, patient run uh, advocacy organizations like the PD Avengers that are doing some really cool work to connect patients and really bring a patient voice to um, some of this dialogue. So um, with that, I will um, stop sharing and I'm happy to um, open it up and take some questions. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, we've been enjoying watching. We've seen you on PD School and um, many other places as well as just meeting you PMD in person. Alliance, yeah, sure. PMD Alliance. A lot yeah. of videos. Yes, lots of stuff. <laughs> and so it, does anyone have any questions? If you'd like to put them in the chat, we can kind of monitor them that way and read them out loud for you. Or if so, you would like to unmute and then mute right after you've already asked your question, that'd be great. Yeah, and it's really great that, you know, we've been trying to create PD Connect under these, you know, uh, to try to engage social interaction, to do the online exercise, to do um, the support groups and all those things, to be a cheerleader. And it's great to see that now there's research supporting what we are doing to, to really make a difference in people's lives. So thank you for doing the research that you do. Any, any questions yeah, here? Some we got some hands up. Robert's got his hand up on after him. Okay, thanks, thanks Jim. Uh, I had a question about the exercise uh, virtually you know, through, through online, such as we do with PD Connect versus exercise in person. Is there any any feeling uh, or is it the exercise that's important or is there more of a social connection when you're doing it uh, face to face? I, mean, I think anytime you can actually be in the presence of another human being and be, you know, able to touch them and, you know, have that face-to-face -face interaction, obviously that's um, quite therapeutic. And we um, realize as humans probably more than we ever have how, you know, important that is. Um, and there is, you know, there are chemicals that are released through, um, you know, touch and feel. And, you know, when you are in the presence of somebody as, you know, in yoga class, for example, when people are able to sort of um, breathe with each other and there's a sort of group experience within, you know, these spaces, I think that, you know, there is an extra level of therapy that's part of that. But I think that, you know, given sort of our need to balance sort of risk for our patients living with Parkinson's um, and safety, you know, around the pandemic and, and with, uh, um, you know, the, the risk of infection and things like that, we've, we've really sort of had a struggle to sort of figure out, you know, how, how much to urge people to get into places with each other. Um, and it's such a fluctuating sort of um, issue that I think, 
you know, many classes had reconvened and then stopped and reconvened. So I think, you know, you still get a lot of benefits actually from a Zoom screen. We haven't done um, a, a ton of research comparing one versus the other quite yet, but I think in other disease states, they they have increasing data. And I think a lot of the providers, like some of the yoga and mindfulness instructors that had said, there's no way I can create, you know, the same you know, sort of resonance and in 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 person vibrations and feels. Um, I think we're quite surprised with how much they actually got out of some of these online modalities. So I think we've been more open to sort of considering it. And I think that, you know, in some ways it's made it more accessible to people who are not able to ever, you know, we've, we've actually been able to offer things to people who never would have been able to leave, you know, a rural community and drive or somebody who might not have, you know, access to transportation. Um, so, and, and even, you know, some people are not comfortable being on camera and people can still participate with having their cameras off. Um, you know, and in some of these spaces, if they don't feel, you know, comfortable from a mental state or physical state perspective of being, you know, seen. Um, so I think it allows accessibility in a way that's kind of exciting. So, um, I, but I think again, you know, we're, if you have the ability to connect um, in person with somebody and it's safe, I think we always, you know, would, would hope that people can to, can try to do that and then you know sort of it goes down from there but but some interaction even on the phone even if you can't see the person um is actually quite therapeutic so even a phone call that's old school and and you know you're lucky enough to have connected this way but think about the people that haven't aren't in this space and if you can even call some of those folks um your neighbors that may not have you know technology access i, I think it can actually be very um, therapeutic to include them and that volunteerism of actually reaching out to somebody um, is actually quite therapeutic, um, you know, just being a volunteer or, or being a connector in some way. So, so urge you to sort of think outside the box a little bit with that. Thank you, doctor. So I think I was next on the raised hand, but I see there's chats too. Uh, doctor, first of all, thank you. That was really special. And so we appreciate the work you do and the presentation you just made to us. I think we're blessed as, as a group of PD Connect with Lisa and Steph who intuitively started in the, along the directions of a lot of the stuff you're talking about. And, and you know, now I've been backed up by working with you and Dr. Oakham and a series of other people. Um, I was really interested in, you, you talked about the sphere, and I forget the word you use, I don't know if it's of influence, but. Spheres it, of connection. Spheres, spheres of connection. So the spheres of connection at intimate and the friends level and societal level. Um, I was wondering if you would agree that, that we don't have to limit those to actually categorize them. I and I think it's, I think it's possible to have an intimate relationship with friends, uh, and if you've been working, yeah, it's just the way, it's just the way they, they classify these sort of spheres. It's like a it, and loneliness has actually been quite researched. There's a guy named John Cacioppa who unfortunately died a few years ago, but he he had come up with these sort of categories from a psychology sort of perspective. So there's a sort of how they define these spheres as intimate. Um, I think there's collective, relational, and then collective. So there's these three kind of categories, but certainly you can have, you know, many, many types of- um, even, even the group, group that we have, you would call societal, but I really believe that we have the ability to, to take the next step and actually be, you know, become, become involved in each other's uh, journeys and how they're doing their path through uh, in dealing with Parkinson's and staying healthy and do exercise and all of that's mental health. I mean, the gift we give to each other uh, is, is is our presence and our enthusiasm and our hope. Uh, and I, I think we as a group have started along that direction. I really appreciate you pushing us forward. Yeah, no, I think it can be hugely therapeutic. What ends up happening, and especially, you know, a lot of what I do is talk to doctors, right? So that's like, you know, I talk to patients and you guys already know this, but, you know, unfortunately our healthcare system is not designed to actually have a sense that I, as a doctor, think that this is important. So a lot of patients think that, well, those guys are all meeting up in that room or whatever, and they're doing that hokey pokey, you know, exercise nonsense. You guys, I'm talking to the believers, right? Y'all are drinking the Kool-Aid already, but doctors don't really think about this. And a lot of what they do is just write a prescription and they say, you know, here's your cinnamon, go home, come back in six months. And so those patients in those spheres don't get the stuff that you get. From this and so we have to really think about how to educate people because again it's really thought of as you know a certain disease to a certain in a certain very visual sort of classification of who gets this what the symptoms are and what then is the therapy is a pill 
And so, you know, as you all know here, it's a non-motor issue that's hugely important. It's a very diverse group. This, this stuff that you choose, exercise, all this stuff is part of the prescription. But, you know, imagine being a patient um, who's really not got any sense of this and they just think it's you know parkinson's is like a a you know a, a bug that they need to treat with a pill and they take the pill and this is all there is you know that's sort of what people sometimes are educated around and it's it's just the way unfortunately that we've disseminated the information and a lot of our um, patients only get to see a neurologist sometimes years into their diagnosis so 50 percent of patients in the country in the u.s don't get care from a neurologist for their Parkinson's, not even a movement disorder special. I'm talking about a neurologist. So 50% of patients only see a primary care doctor. They have a sense of what neurologic disease is, which is just take this pill and come back in six months. So they are not getting so much of what you have realized makes you thrive and what is really, you know, the sort of um, secret sauce in some ways. So, and so we have to teach people and the stuff that, you know, Lisa and stuff are doing is important because they're trying to teach physical therapists and, and disseminate that. They, I met them at Becky Farley's training and Becky Farley is really trying to teach about, you know, how physical therapists can be part of that movement of social prescribing, get people connected and how we all have to cheerlead about this. But unfortunately, this is sort of not the mainstay and it took this long to even get a task force to even talk about this at the Movement Disorder Society. So. You know, this, these are these are hard and interesting conversations to try to force my colleagues to <laughs> listen to. So, thank you. Doesn't really matter, right? I just gotta get back. No, one second. I'm just gonna close the door. And never, Steve, Steve Arena. We see your hand up. Thanks. Um, one of the things that makes some sense to me is for the insurance companies and Medicare to be pulled into this to cover something like yoga as an example uh, in terms of the dollars that um, might be spent to help Parkinson's uh, patients. And what thought do you have about that in terms of it's first, certainly you want to get the doctors involved, but if people can't afford it or a piece of it or something like that, Medicare, insurance companies need to be a part of the solution. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that that is part of the problem is a lot of these things, it's hard to study, right? Because people are doing different things. It's not something that we can. And, and when we talk about these integrative modalities, like let's say even something like adding turmeric and food, cooking a curry with turmeric and putting it you know, in food and helping people with their cognition, they, the way that we in Western medicine then take that is like we take that root and we take that you know, curry idea we put powder in a pill and then we try to prescribe it three times a day and, and then we sort of take that uh, and compare it against a placebo powder that also looks yellow. Like it's, these are like lifestyle things that are integrated into your life. It's very hard to take that and study it in the way that we um, have got modern medicine to happen. And in, the ladies here can tell you how long, we all know that exercise is medicine for so many diseases, but it's taken probably a good 30 years of research in various types of ways for people to even believe to some degree that exercise makes a difference for Parkinson's patients. And it actually took one of my colleagues 20 years to help con the concept of non-motor symptoms and Parkinson's really even get propagated. And so, you know, people have just been so focused on what they can see, tremor, what they can measure, what we can, you know, de design in trials. And so, so much of what we end up studying really has very little to do with what matters to patients, unfortunately. So you're, you're absolutely right. We have to find ways to study this probably better and then get people to pay for it and convince insurance companies that, you know, this, this can make a difference, even though, you know, I think many of us truly believe it. What I'm trying to do is to have a sense also that, you know, we may not have evidence for everything um, in medicine, but that if it's not harmful and it's relatively accessible and cheap, and it makes sense that we can kind of use this in a prescriptive way 
while we're trying to gather the evidence at the same time. So, um, you know, I think that none of us want people to be sold any snake oil or do harmful things to people, but certainly things like getting together and having, you know, a coffee with a friend. I don't know that I have to have like 10 trials to prove that that makes a difference, right? So. Who's next? Any more questions right now? There's also some questions in the chat. Um, and the, go ahead. Yeah, so I see. Um, <laughs> so what Christina says, I have a sister who's always talking about politics. It scares me the things she says. Should I tell her stuff? Well, so I think when we're talking about the negative stuff and sort of sometimes just getting overwhelmed with thoughts that are very negative, um, there is a tendency, and, and with Parkinson's as well, anxiety and depression are quite common. And as we mentioned about the social connection and social isolation, when you have things that are kind of thrown at you that upset you and send, send you into this sort of bad mental state, I think to try to minimize those or avoid those is off, often quite helpful. So if you know who triggers you or what types of shows, you know, make you mentally kind of unwell, um, you know, turn them off, you know, or, or limit them. Um, because I think that the mind and the brain and the body are very, very connected. So, um, and we see time and time again, when we see patients who are anxious or upset, um, you know, their physical state gets worse. And when they see themselves in a worse physical state, the mental state can get worse. And it's really this downward spiral. So I think if you know, kind of what's not helping you, I think it's always better to try to limit it or avoid it. Um, and uh, thoughts about dealing with later stages of PD progression, planning options. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, there's, there is, um, you know, a lot of educational offerings out there. Um, I think that, you know, uh, depending on where you are, sometimes um, uh, planning and options can be helped by um, folks like a social worker can be very helpful, um, depending on what community you happen to live in. Um, if you're older, um, geriatrics doctors are actually often very equipped to deal with things like planning and you know, um, things like that. There's also this new specialty um, called palliative care. It's not really that new, but it's been getting more um, sort of uh, um, airtime amongst neurologists. And those folks are often very patient-centered, um, can really think about not just today, but the future, help people to un understand how to make um, decisions for, um, you know, advanced care planning. And I think all of us should really think, you know, in this COVID timeframe where anything can happen to anyone and has happened to anyone, pe perfectly healthy people have gone into the hospital and never left um, in this time frame. I think it's always important to sort of have very frank discussions with, um, you know, what you would want to happen should you get sick. You know, if, would you want to have um, certain types of uh, measures uh, like CPR, um, like intubation? Would you want to have, um, a, you know, an ICU stay, things like that, you know, so that you can really align these uh, with what your goals are um, and what you believe in. And there's forms that you can actually fill out depending on where you are and work with your primary care doctor to really, you know, sort of make these sort of plans. Um, and I think, you know, doctors are sometimes not great when they're busy at having these conversations. So, you know, um, learning a little bit about some of these things and then going in and having a specific visit just for this with your doctor and say, hey, doc, I was hoping to fill out the, for example, the POLST form um, spelled P-O-L-S-T. You know, I want to sit down and talk to you about this. And then you can kind of go through the options and, and feel like you've, you know, been able to do that, you know, with, um, you know, sort of somebody who knows your care um, and can advise you. So, so that would be um, good. Uh, so there's some other questions on blue lens therapy, glasses with blue lenses. So um, I believe that's to cut out blue light. Um, and I think that, you know, that those have been studied a little bit. Um, I think in general, you know, the, the sense is, is that if you're, uh, sleep is important. And if you're getting too much uh, light um, towards nighttime, the brain uh, can get tricked into thinking it's uh, supposed to be awake. So, and patients with Parkinson's often have sleep dysfunction anyways, and sleep is hugely important. So I think from a sleep hygiene perspective, we try to tell people to shut off their devices. 
um, an hour or two before they go to bed. Don't leave it near your bed. So you're, you know, going to wake up in the night if you wake up and start looking at your phone or your emails. I know this is easier said than done for many of us, but, you know, if you can really wind down, put your, you know, devices away so you're not seeing that blue light and just read with an old school book so that you don't have that light. And then in the morning, when you wake up, see the sunlight when you first wake up, that's actually very therapeutic. And if you can go outside and be around natural light and around trees and around nature, it can actually help restore the circadian rhythm and help you to get more into a cycle. And then again, wind down, try not to take too many naps in the day. That's also important. It's hard to get good sleep at night if you're napping in the day and try to stay active. So exercise can actually be very helpful for um, staying awake and trying to help with the circadian rhythm balance. So um, something about naturopaths are concerned with levels of homocysteine and its relation to dementia risk. I wonder if this is something you test for. So there are some vitamins that we test in older people. This has been a question that's come up a few times. Um, generally, most people, especially the above of maybe the age of 60, it's not a bad idea to check something like B12 levels. Um, homocysteine can certainly be part of a panel, especially with lipids and things like that um, for stroke risk. Um, there's also a sense that thyroid should be checked um, once a year in populations. Um, folate is another vitamin. Vitamin D is another one um, that is important. Um, so these are things that we do check. There's not a standard lab test protocol. I know Dr. Mishley um, has a list that she likes to give and I work quite closely with Dr. Mishley. And I know she thinks homocysteine is something that she definitely has, has used um, in, in the screening lab work that she does. But I would say by and large, most Parkinson's docs don't have like a list that is, you know, one size fits all. But the, the labs that I just mentioned are very reasonable. Um, hold one second. And then there's a question about, yeah, the virtual support group with the PMD Alliance is open to whoever that's not limited. And there's a lot of those videos on YouTube, so you can watch them. Um, Dr. Mishley came on, uh, somebody wrote here about five wishes has the forms. We had a few uh, of the um, palliative care people come on to give talks. Um, Maya Katz came on um, to give a talk. And I believe she's up in your guys' area and some other folks around, um, advanced care planning and things with the videos that I did. So that would be under, I'll just put it in, um, Holistic was the series with the PMD Alliance and it's under YouTube. So if you look on there, um, those, they have, we have some video offerings that we talked a lot um, to a number of folks around palliative care issues. And, and I think, you know, sometimes the word palliative care freaks people out a little bit. They're like, I don't, you know, I don't want to be put on some dying patient protocol, or I'm not actively dying, why would I want to go see this bunch of people that I'm not really needing yet. But I think the principles of palliative care, so some of the stuff that I talked about, so being patient centered, caring about your goals, so what matters to you, what brings you meaning and purpose, thinking about the multidisciplinary team, so the ladies here, like the physical therapy gang, these different types of people who are in your universe that may actually be able to connect you with um, better um, sorts of um, offerings that may be in your community. Um, thinking a little bit about what, you know, we talked about with that advanced care planning, making sure your goals of care are aligned. Um, those are all things that I think the palliative care folks can actually be very helpful for. And they often work in teams with social work, sometimes a psychologist, sometimes even a psychiatrist, sometimes, you know, different types of folks, physical therapy, um, all kinds of folks. So I think, you know, that's not a bad way to, you know, sometimes um, connect with some of these sort of principles and stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, if you're worried, it doesn't hurt to get a sense of things and you can always decline future visits. But I think, you know, um, it's always sometimes good to get um, a, a, a little bit of a different viewpoint, um, you know, when, when um, you're working within a framework in the health system, you just never know who, who may be an ally. And I've found sometimes that for our patients that, you know, they found allies and cheerleaders in the most, um, you know, sort of unexpected ways. So it might be not just the 15 minutes that your Parkinson's doc or your neurologist has, but maybe, you know, uh, a motivated um, physical therapist or yoga teacher, or, you know, even a religious leader that might have taken an interest in your health and can help guide you. I'm pretty open-minded to, you know, 
not just me as the main person who knows everything about health. I think, you know, if nothing else, my exploration within these mind body spaces and within these other spaces really made me realize that I think, you know, many of us have people that define health for us and are, are, are our cheerleaders in, in our own communities. And we may not even realize how important they are until, you know, we really are like, oh yeah, you know, I, I realize that, you know, for me, it might be my, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know, hairdresser or the woman who works at the diner where you get a coffee every morning who checks in on you and makes sure you're okay. So you just, you know, I think healthcare and, you know, provision of health doesn't have to be somebody in a white coat. Um, somebody, I saw another raised hand. Oh yeah, Robert. Yeah, I had a question about the use of the uh, levodopa type medications. Uh, if you start them or if you take too much, does that lessen lessen its efficiency over the long run? In other words, are, is there a certain dose, certain amount of doses that you take cumulatively that yeah. uh, that uh, may hamper the Parkinson's at the at the long end, or or do you just is there a limit to to too much? The main reason I ask. So I had some problem with sleeping difficulty. I went through sleeping disorder clinics and, and uh, sleep apnea tests and stuff and a wide variety of uh, medications, most of which were uh, like antidepressant, lower doses of antidepressant types of medications. And uh, when I, and uh, I was sort of fidgeting around in bed. And simply by increasing my uh, Ritera, the, the long-acting uh, levodopa, mm -hmm. uh, to a fourth dose, this sort of mir it was like a miracle, just sort of solved by sleep disorder. Yeah. And uh, so I was wondering that the, now I'm taking uh, like a, do a dozen a day. So I was wondering if that's going to harm my long-term prospects or, yeah. or should I try to keep it down lower? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I, I think this will probably be the last question. I think we wrap up at 3.30, but, um, you know, not to speak specifically to your exact number of pills, it's hard to, you know, sort of give you direct advice, but I think globally, I am a believer in Parkinson's medicines. I, you know, as is Dr. Mitchell, even though she's a naturopath, I think we, we, we totally believe in the merits of replacing dopamine in a disease where dopamine is missing. Not everything that is part of Parkinson's is responsive to dopamine. So a lot of the non-motor issues, for example, depression or certain types of sleep issues may require a different chemical to be tweaked. So it might be serotonin, for example, or melatonin, different types of things. Um, there are non-motor issues in Parkinson's that do respond to dopamine, but it's not just, you know, I feel bad, so let me take more and more and more. So I think it's important that one, you know, checks in with the doctor, make sure that we're taking it, that it's being absorbed well, that it makes sense, the timing and how much uh, the formulations and things, but there's not really, you know, a top end of a cap for, you know, the maximum amount of pills. And most people, you know, do need Parkinson's medicines that include levodopa at some point in their life. And we are not the types of physicians anymore that really are waiting for some horrible day where you can't get off your couch in order to start levodopa. I think many of us believe that if you can take it and it makes you continue to be active in your social life and in your things that you love and exercising and helps you travel if you love to do it or see your grandchildren if you love to do it, that that's right. That's the right thing to do for you. It should really be customized to what your hopes are, what your symptoms are, and that we try to give it to help restore function. We're not really waiting for disability to be horrible before we give it. I think, you know, the phobia of levodopas, you know, that's not happening these days. We really believe that that along with these lifestyle measures can really be sort of the secret sauce to helping people. So I think it's not unusual, your story about feeling better when levodopa was tweaked. But I think, again, it, it sort of depends on the symptom, depends on, you know, the dosing and, and often we'll try it. If it doesn't help, we might take it away. So we just don't want to give more is not necessarily better, but we also, you know, there's not a top end of a, of a pill that we say is like the maximum amount that we can give. <laughs> Thanks so much, you guys, for um, letting me jump on here. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Part of this group. It's such a lovely thing to see all of your faces. And I love the diversity too. I'm seeing some women, all kinds of folks on here. So it seems like you have a really great group. And uh, I think you're in good hands and to keep up the good work with uh, 
you know, connecting. Cause I love the fact that you said that you have your own connection through this group and that's part of your spheres, which I think we're, we're this is part of the social prescribing that we're trying to encapsulate a little bit more and help people to realize as part of the medicine. So, so keep up the good work with that. Thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful. Uh, we appreciate your passion. You're so dedicated to everything with your yeah. work, everything. Your advocacy yes, and all your of research it. research and all yeah. of that. Yeah, and thank you for everyone else who came today. That It's been great. Don't worry, this is being recorded. We will send this out to you. So you do have the slides and, and we appreciate all of you. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. Thanks, doctor, okay. for what you do. That was very special. Thank awesome. you. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, thank you.